So we are very pleased to have with us today, Teresa Christman. She is the Director of Public Affairs for the Maryland State Police. And she's here today to talk with us about fire and life safety, know before an emergency strikes. So Teresa, we're so glad to have you with us. We know you have many years of on the ground experience in this and you do a lot of teaching around um, fire safety. And we appreciate your time today. And it would be great if maybe um, before you start, if you could just share a bit more about your background so folks know where you're coming from. Uh, so I just recently retired from Prince George's County Fire Department. I did 21 years with them. And I now work for the Office of State Fire Marshal, which is a department of the state police. And um, through the actions here, I am part of the PIO group and I do all the community risk reduction for the state. So uh, working alongside with the other agencies, um, trying to get out there and try to educate the best we possibly can. And I am also currently the NFPA state representative for community risk reduction and Vision 2020. It's another um, national program that I'm um, overseeing the state and support the state fire department. So there's 300 and 65 departments or corporations in the state of Maryland. And that's um, that, that's just the volunteer side. There's So you have your, your metro departments. And then for both career and volunteer, there's over 769, I think 69 um, actual physical fire stations. So that's between EMS and fire stations. So what our office is um, mainly focuses on is the areas of the state that are not um, oversaw by that agency. So we are in um, seven different locations in the state of Maryland, um, ensuring out of the 23 counties in the Baltimore city area, uh, we help support and then um, do the main investigations for uh, the state of Maryland. If depending like Prince George's, Montgomery County, Howard, Anne Arundel, uh, places like that, they have their own investigation unit. We will help assist if something is necessary. But overall, I'm working with all the de departments to get them the educational resources and needs to get them out there. So my, my plate is, is rather um, full. <laughs> I'm sure. But I take that fullness as knowing that we can make a difference in Maryland. That's our whole goal is to make a difference in, in everybody's lives. Well, thank you, Teresa. We appreciate you being here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Great, so folks may join over the next few minutes. So um, Teresa, you can go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, folks, if you can keep introducing yourself in the chat if you have not done that already. And just a reminder that we're happy to take questions and comments. So feel free to drop those in the chat as well. And that this session is being recorded. So you'll be able to share it with colleagues um, if there's information that you would like for them to be able to access as well. Everybody have, can see this without any problems? Looks good to me. Okay, great. So um, I was asked, tasked to help you guys. And um, this is a program that I had created a long time ago, but it's so relevant. All I gotta do is change the seals and I can help everybody. Um, I created this program probably, when I went back it was 2011 and I was assisting a couple of places in, in Prince George's County that needed help with their facilities. So I, I just added a whole bunch of different things to help support the message throughout the state, but it's usually pretty much universal for everybody. So moving forward. So let's test your knowledge. So a little bit, um, I'd like to start off with fire prevention as the aspect of uh, understanding a little, a little things that we have in life. So, um, oops, got it away. So from you all and your perspective of being at home, what is the perspective of households that have actually developed and practiced a fire escape plan to ensure they could escape quickly and safely? So it's A is 50%, B is 30%, C is 23%, or D is 75%. How many do you think have actually practiced? Have you all practiced a home escape plan in your, your home itself? So what do you all think? If you can unmute, if you ask. Unfortunately, I think it's probably the lowest number. The 23? Yeah. yeah actually, yes, it is. It's 23% of the um, United States has not planned or practiced some kind of fire drill. And what I'll tell people to do is 
especially with their kids, if their kids have come home and they've said, hey, we had a fire drill today, let's then practice our own fire drill at our home. Uh, one of the fire marshals is having his house rebuilt and his son had to do a fire drill at home and they had to like show what his house was. Well, right now they're in a camper right next to their house, you know, and his fire escape plan showed a camper and it had wheels on it and everything. And that was his surroundings and that's what he knows. So it's very important that we all think about that and go on home. So tonight, plan and practice your fire drill. The next one is, um, I gotta figure out how to. Teresa, I think you may have accidentally muted yourself. Okay, so more than half of the home fire deaths result from incidents reported between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., and 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. What time do you all think, do you, do you see us having the more reported time frames? 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Okay, anybody else? 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Okay, we have an A, we have a D. Anybody else? I think the one to six a.m. Uh, to the six oh one. Okay, so honestly, it is the eleven p.m. to seven a.m. That's our sleeping time, and a lot of times when people will come home, um, they'll put something on the stove and fall asleep and forget about it. Uh, we had a gentleman uh, in Laurel a couple of years ago. Um, I was working in what we called the watch office at that time frame, and the call came out for an apartment building at um, about 6.30 in the morning. So our crews had gone out there, and it was a devastated fire. Uh, to the, his unit only, they were very lucky. He was able to get out. He was awoken um, because he got off at work at like 5 o'clock in the morning. He decided that he was going to cook some hamburgers and some french fries. And at six o'clock in the morning, to us, that's like a breakfast time. But to him, that's his dinner time. Well, he was so tired from work, he had gone to his bedroom, sat on the edge of his bed, and he had actually started to take his shoes off and he fell asleep. So the oil to the French fries had started to get really hot and it um, combusted and flash fired um, the side of the um, walls of the kitchen. So that's why we see a lot of that time frame of that nature of people being sleepy, coming home, um, being intoxicated under medication. You know, how many times have we all been taking a lot of medication for just various sniffles, sinuses? Uh, people have been on COVID. What has it done to our systems? And um, it it just makes us sleepy. So at that time frame, we see the more um, reported home fire deaths. figure this out. Okay. And a fire, you have as little as two minutes to escape. How a recent poll showed three quarters of Americans still think that they have less than four, less than six, less than 10 minutes before a fire can turn really deadly. What do you think that time frame would be? Less than four minutes. Okay. We have a four. Anybody else? Thinking 10. <laughs> 10. Okay. Anybody else? Well, honestly, it is less than 10 minutes. But our problems are that we really only have less than two to three minutes to mm -hmm. escape a fire. Uh, what we see now is uh, it used to be called legacy furniture, where you had furniture that was made of cotton, woods. Now everything's the plastics and um, just different materials that burn faster and hotter. And um, we really don't have that time frame to get out. We need to get out. When that alarm sounds, we need to go. That's why it's very important. And then our last question is, I'm sorry. Um, in the event of a fire in your work area, your best course of action is leave the area using a designated escape route attempt to fight the fire and rescue others, and shelter in a room without a window. What do you all think that is? A. A. Okay, we got A's. 
Yep, it is that, that designated way to get out. That's the important part that we want to do. We want to practice our plans, ensure that we know what's doing, um, ensure that our, our, um, our um, employees know what's going on. We want, you want to know, want our residents of our locations to know what's going on because ultimately they, they will need to react also if they can. So I have a little history here. Um, so a lot of people thought the O'Leary's cow actually started the fire, the Great Chicago Fire. But while researching some stuff, we found that um, the Great Chicago Fire was actually started by three guys. They were gambling. Um, they were in the O'Leary's barn and they were um, uh, stealing milk and gambling away. So to cover up their crimes, they had actually used a candle and set the fire. And because of that time frame. It had been like um, what we're suffering now with these crazy winds and um, just high heat temperatures um, at that time frame. It was um, very windy. It was a wind driven fire and it took out a majority of, well, it took out the whole aspect of Chicago. Sorry. Um, so that happened on Sunday, October 8th. So the O'Leary's, if you see this picture, that is a picture, um, a replica of the Great Chicago Fire, what it looked like as the masses were leaving. But the problem was the O'Leary's, um, they went to their deathbed never knowing that um, this story had been made up by a gentleman that died on his deathbed years later saying that um, he had made the story up because they had confessed to him. And to sensationalize the story, he created this whole, um, because he owned a paper, he was able to like get something going on. So that's what he did. So the O'Leary's went to their deathbed never knowing that their cow, like, they got blamed for everything. They were just like completely like thrown away. It was really bad for them. So the same time frame, so on Sunday, October 8th through the 10th of October, the Great Michigan Fire actually occurred. Um, the Pasigo, West Highland, and Amantites of Michigan, they had a rather large brush fire going on, but because they were really all of um, like a timber loss fire, there was not much written about them, but um, because Chicago being a port town, they got all the, um, how do you say, I, want, I don't want to use the words accolades, but that's where everybody was talking about. They, they just, everything was focused on them. So, um, under President Truman, he brought out, because everybody was actually celebrating the Great Chicago Fire, there was never, there was parades, there was carnivals, there was no education. So he brought um, every governor uh, in the United States and one school teacher to Washington, D.C. And for three days, they called it the Truman Summit. And um, I have an honor, I've gotten to go to, to one of them. I'm going to his next summit in um, actually three weeks from now to Missouri, to his home. Um, they're bringing us all there together to see what we can do to go forward in fire prevention and life safety skills. And um, that's what um, my job is now. Like I'm doing exactly what he wants us to do, getting out there, talking. Um, and to say, we don't wanna celebrate the, the, the badness, but we gotta talk about the badness. We, gotta, we have to make change in ourselves and change in our actions to facilitate that we don't have any more fire fatalities. Currently, the state of Maryland has 33. And um, we work very hard in the state to ensure that everybody gets the message and understanding. So that's what we're doing for his, his um, thoughts. And then um, just to let you know, um, last year, close to 3,800 people died from home fires uh, across this country. Um, I believe Maryland is in the 70s, close to almost 80. Um, we have a lower number, but we work very hard. We have a lot of different nuances in place. We have smoke alarms, we have carbon monoxide alarms, we have sprinkler systems. Uh, we have them here where a lot of places you can go to Pennsylvania, they don't have it. Well, they definitely did have the law, but the governor would never sign it. Uh, Delaware has a law, but they don't have to enact it. So it's it's very strange. Like we, we all try to work really hard, but politicians get in the way and we just try to do our very best to what we have for to make a change. So as you know, as fire is fast, fire is hot, dark and deadly. 
whatever's on television, that is not true. That is something that I always have a hard time trying to deal with because ultimately the, um, the media or in, in movies sensationalize uh, a fire scene. It, that is not what happens. Like I have a brother, uh, brothers, my dad, they were all in the fire department. They all did this stuff. Um, I rode an ambulance for a long time from the age of 16 to the age of 33. And I stopped when I came into prevention. And um, so I've been a part of this for a long time and I know how bad fire can occur and how fast it can roll. So that's why it's really important to understand that even the fire department does not see in a smoky condition as none of us would be able to see in a smoky condition. So that's why we have all these plans to help us move forward. So today, what I wanna focus everybody's um, roles are on the responsibility of what your emergency preparation would be like, um, what you all would do an evacuation if an emergency was to occur, um, follow the race, rescue, alert, contain motto, and then having the understanding of how to um, use a um, extinguisher and making sure that you understand the past syndrome, uh, syndrome, <laughs> cinnamon of pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. And then there's um, things that I talk about type of alarm so everybody understands. And then the emergency must knows. And then um, just, we're gonna check your safety knowledge a little bit more again. Oops. So what everybody understands for their preparedness is if you do have a fire in your facility, how are you going to contain it? What do you do to contain it? What are your extinguishers? Where are they located? Where the fire alarms or the pool stations or alarms are located? Your exits and then the safe places in your facility. If you have to self-evacuate or you have to self-contain patients in a room, if you have to stay there for a certain amount of time until help comes along, and then if you have to do the sheltering in place, what would you do? How would you handle it? And to show of hands, how many of your facilities have fire doors? So you understand when the alarms go off, the fire doors will close. They don't physically stay open. So that magnet will uh, disengage the door and then it closes completely. Those doors are rated for two hours. Um, they're, they're designed that smoke's not supposed to come through them. Um, I did have to write up um, apartment complex. Um, they had put fire doors in, redid them, but when they did a bump out on the wall, it was actually keeping the fire door open. So once you would um, turn on the um, fire alarm, the doors would never engage or disengage. So um, they had to go back and correct that. And then um, fully knowing your awareness, understanding what everybody's job and role is very, very important. So how many of you all have actually thought about a plan of action? How are you all going to do these things? What are you going to do in place? Has, has anybody done that yet? Carol has. How many, Carol, so let me ask you a question. How many people are in your, your facility? Um, we have 116 apartments. As of two months ago, we started a fire and safety team. Okay. And implemented some things um, to help. We've had fire drills. We've had two fire drills since. This is a senior living, 62 and over. So we have the horizontal, the vertical, the vertical, and yeah. the stand in place people. So when you walk your property, what do your stairwells look like? Do you have the area of refuge in your stairwell? Um, I'm assuming that the stairwells are safe and they got the safe doors. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, so the area of refuge. So, so if somebody had to go to the floor landing, is there mm -hmm. a large area that if you had wheelchair, um, your, your residents have a wheelchair, they have ability to stay there until we can bring a stair chair up to them? Yes. Okay. So that's what the area of refuge is. Okay. Yes. Yes. Those are the horizontal people. Yeah, so that's where it's very important, you know, like a lot of times, like a lot of the, some of the stuff that I'm talking about is healthcare facilities, but really it's, it's changed the name of what I have there to your residents and mm -hmm. it's the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's walking that property and you got to walk it daily, honestly, 
like um like so the last storm we had was like what a week ago and tuesday i lost power from tuesday to thursday mm. uh, bad thing is i'm actually i had purchased a all home generator <laughs> the pad's been poured the generator's not here yet so uh, <laughs> yeah so i lost a lot of stuff that day i was very scared because by the time i came home that night I couldn't see anything. I, I, my visibility was very, very poor. The lights were gone. I had a flashlight on my phone. I was at use that. I got in and um, it was kind of weird. I had just made a PowerPoint about having working flashlights. So I had a flashlight. I just changed the batteries on and I had that on the table. So I was able to get that and go out. And um, we found a lot of trees down in our neighborhood. We lost power, like I said, for the two and a half days but um it's just you all have that added responsibility now you have your own property now you got to come here and that's what your team is all about having different people do different things um please ask that your maintenance people walk the property daily i mean that's a big thing look for those hidden hazards possibly that could be in and around the home or your um your residence your building um and, and just report unsafe acts. If you see something that's not good, uh, make sure that everybody understands that, you know, you gotta put stuff away. Uh, we went into a building one time where they had, um, their garage had, was dismantled. And until they actually got a new garage, they had all of their lawn mowers, gas cans, paint, everything in the bottom stairwell. And that was actually blocking the exit door. So we had to move all that out to ensure that they could have a safe facility. So it's like just good house cleaning, as I was going to say. And remember to stay calm as much as possible. I've always wanted to include the guy from um, Animal House when the band is going after them and they're like, oh, he's freaking out at the end of the street. Well, our job is to stay calm as much as possible to ensure that everybody remains calm on their end. If they see you calm, then they're calm. So it's, it's important. And I know that our emotions can be the best of us. And I, I stay calm as much as possible, but I, I can tell you, I'll freak out with you also. And then um, with your teams, having those daily tasks to go along to ensure that everything is safe, then you're good. And I would include like how Carol said that they hmm. I think we may have lost Teresa for a moment. I have a question for when she comes back. We'll just be a part of it. You know? oh, Teresa, you cut out for just a moment. Sure. Teresa, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You cut out for like the last 15 seconds or so. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's know. okay. And I think uh, Linda, was it Linda who had a question? Oh, yeah. Linda, okay. Linda had a question as well. Go ahead, Linda. Well, at the same time now. Um, so I'm in a senior housing complex also, and we were directed by our local fire department that we really should have a shelter in place policy as opposed to an evacuation policy because of, you know, the, the abilities of our seniors to go down steps or the inability of our seniors to go down steps. Yep. So, yep. Where are you located, Linda? I'm in Owings Mills. Owings, okay. All right. So and we have a five buildings but we have about 500 people total oh wow okay so having that shelter in place program um so i for my county when i worked for pg we had what's called we did the shelter in place we i gave a talk on that and i can share that program with you all too so that gives you an idea of what to do to set it up we also did a file of life so that um if the the medics or the ambulance crew had to come into the apartment they were able to pull that vial with all their medication but what also we did is in your knox box keys we did a program where um you can't get into the knox box so that the fire department can get into the knox box um you can make a list of all the people that are bedridden or they they're going to need a, additional assistance getting out so a lot of the departments in, across maryland have developed a plan of um, when a large high rise or mid rise or low rise situation uh, uh, is brought before them, um, they will do a shelter in place for the fire floors that are not affected. 
So if your floor is affected, if the second floor has the fire, we're gonna um, have everybody leave on the first, second and third floors. But anybody like on the fifth or above, the fourth or above, they'll shelter in place. And that stops from people from getting hurt. And a lot of people don't understand that. And they'll freak out and say, well, you just told me to evacuate. Now you're telling me not to evacuate. Well, each situation is different. And a lot of the departments across the state of Maryland, they follow the same rule. They'll send additional units to your location because they know what your location is. And they will send the additional people to go deal with those, those higher floors and to reassure everybody. And what I'll do is I'll put all that together, send it to them so they can send it out to you guys to see what we've done so that everybody sees that type of plan because it's a great aspect. It saves people. Um, people freak out that I say that because I'll do. I'm like, one minute, here's the problem. And then I'll tell you to evacuate. But then in the second thing I'm telling you, well, now I want you to shelter in place. So it kind of becomes confusing, but the scenarios that are outlined explain why we do this. And it's all about safety. Sometimes it's the most safest places to remain in your apartment or if it's a condo or whatever you have um, because your doors are rated to burn for a certain time frame. That that's very well, you probably have a metal door in the front door, correct? A lot of you have metal doors. They're actually glass doors going into the lobby. No, no, no I'm talking about your have apartment. fire rated doors. Your fire rated doors into the apartments. Definitely. And You're probably you cut um, off certain areas. Yep. yep. So then you, also what happens is once the alarms go off and then you have the um, fire door shut, that's another barrier of protection that um, helps people. And and that like it's all like a whole thing. But I like I said. Uh, movies and the media make it very hard for sometimes for us to uh, explain to people because they'll watch a movie, um, especially if you ever watch Mean Girls, where the guy has a big fight in the gym and he goes over and pulls the fire alarm and then all of a sudden the sprinklers go off. That doesn't happen. A sprinkler only goes off where the fire actually occurs until if it moves to another sprinkler, that's when that sprinkler will go off. So it's only in that area. It's not the whole building's not going to go off. So trying to explain that sometimes can be a little concerning too, but um, we will put that together for you guys and we'll share that also. So, Teresa, we also used to do that Knox box list that you're referring to. Yeah. I've been here a really long time. And the last time we spoke to the fire department, they discouraged that also. They were saying because the population changes so much. And then at one point someone was fine and tomorrow they break their hip and they just said that the list was so changing that they were just going to do, you know, um, talk to the um, I don't know where that noise is coming from. Okay. That, you know, the people who were in imminent danger, they were going to deal with first. And, you know, and then they would kind of go, you know, in um, ascending or descending order of, you know, the people who would be affected. And they were saying the Knox box list was pretty not not useful to them. And okay, well, well. So I'm ju I'm just trying to get the update. And the thing is, I've been not to brag, but I've been here a really long time. And over time, the recommendations keep changing. About for all of this, like for example, the Knox box list, and now not the Knox box list. And before, I mean, up until probably. Um, Four years ago, we were always having fire drills and evacuations. And then, like I said, around four years ago, they said stop the evacuations, do 100% shelter in place, and that was they would that evacuate the them as telling you that, or was that your 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 property management? No, no, no. It's always been the fire department. Really? And okay. Baltimore County. All right. They have had some changes there, so I will I will talk to him about that. Because really, ultimately, we're saying the same thing. If you, if you, you're going to have to leave the building if your area is affected, and then you would shelter in place if your fire floor is not affected. Um, so I'll ask him that question, then I'll get you all the answers for that. Okay. And thank where, you. where's the property again, Linda? Um, it's Weinberg Village in Owens Mills. Okay. I'll talk to him about that because okay, that is confusing and we shouldn't do that. Um, yes. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a, the five key healthcare facility um, programs that I, I think about. Um, um, so let me ask you a question. Does, does anybody have a kitchen type mass kitchen in their facility, their location, or is it independent kitchens? We have a mass kitchen at St. Elizabeth's nursing home. Okay, so this is where it's really important um, for anybody that has this type of system set up. Um, so I got some numbers from the NFPA. The last thing they had is actually 2015. They're a little behind on their data, but um, cooking equipment was 66% of the fires between 2011 and 2015. This is where the report comes from. Um, they need to update their report, but um, it's, it's not, cleaning the system properly. It's especially the grease built up. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I just have to pull the grease traps. Well, honestly, it's that piece above that's in the um, vent area that needs to be cleaned really well also because all that is is that, that grease build up then becomes a combustion if something flashes. So it's really important to keep everything clean as much as possible. I did a home um, fire inspection one time and this lady was cooking and um, I couldn't understand what was on her cabinets. And I went to touch the cabinet and it was greased. It had never been cleaned. So literally like you could just scrape down the grease and I could not leave that house with that kitchen that way. So we were literally de-cleaning everything. So um, it's important every time they finish cooking, they got to clean it. Uh, a deep clean should be done like every couple of weeks. But every time you finish cooking, you just got to clean everything up. It's really important. The next one is um, a lot of oxygen and um, people are still smoking. And I do have something here that I'd like to show everybody if you can see it. Um, this is actually a piece that the state of Maryland is using. Um, we've gotten some, um, we're using it through Fabscom. But what it is to take it out. This is a, a piece that goes on the oxygen tube and it stops fire from occurring. If you can see that, it's, I mean, it's really hard to see, but this is the name of the company. I know it's backwards. I guess I should, I'll try to, it's like a fire break. So you put it um, so many feet from the actual, it's 12 inches from the, um, um, oxygen, the O2, and then it's uh, 12 inches from the person. Um, so what it does is it stops the fire. So if the person was smoking and they're on oxygen, um, it would literally, um, it's a fire break. It will, it, will, it will stop the fire from advancing through the tube and, and causing a burn to someone. So that's why it's important. And then I'll take a picture of that and send it to you guys so you see it. But we have the ability to get them through what's called FABSCOM, Fire and Burn Coalition of Maryland. And um, we can help you with that because as we know, smoking and oxygen does not mix. It's very, 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 very volatile and flammable. And then um, it's important to maintain that, that regular fire suppression system, especially with your maintenance crews. They need to ensure that yearly the um, fire extinguishers are checked and that means they are pulled out of there and they are serviced they are tested they are to ensure that they're working properly and also your fire sprinkler system has to be tested yearly also and keeping those records i cannot stress how important it is to ensure that you have all that stuff so if you all are missing something then you need to go back to whoever's been servicing it and or whoever has been inspecting it and ensuring that you have a copy of that for your records to ensure that your health care, uh, your facility, um, your apartment complex, your senior living facilities are all met with um, high standard. It's so important to keep those things in place. Oops. And then um, this is where we talk about everybody coming together and working together on evacuation plans and drills. Um, just that having that risk assessment of your building is so important. 
And like everybody, if you have the team, that's good. Have them part of this, have them know everybody what's supposed to do, who's gonna be responsible for each floor, break the floors in half. You might need more than just one person per floor, depending on how many floors you have. If you have an elevator that's centralized, use that as your break point. And that way everybody on this side of the building is gonna go some way and it's gonna go out that way. And if you are outside, you can say, Ms. Smith is outside, Mr. Jones is outside, Mr. Karen's outside, everybody's outside, we're all accounted for. And then have that one person um, report to management and then say, look, everybody's out, we're good to go. So that doesn't uh, add a burden to the fire service who's coming there because we wanna ensure that everybody's out and they're not we're looking for anybody. And if you recognize that hazard, please correct it immediately. Uh, I cannot tell you how important that is. We've pointed out things before in the past to other locations and they never fix it. Just like I went back to that one apartment building in Oxon Hill, that door was never fixed. They did have a problem. The fire alarm still alert one year of that one time frame after that, and that door did not work very well. So they did have smoke conditions in that building. If that door had worked properly, that smoke would have never advanced to the other side of the building. And that, that was a big concern. So that was one thing I made sure before I left that was fixed. Oops. And then um, this is where I have some things in here about fire extinguisher training. Um, there's different companies you can actually get with. Um, some of the fire departments actually have this where you can actually prevent, uh, do some extinguisher training, understanding how an extinguisher works, how it works is the important part of it, uh, how to aim it, where to aim it, uh, what that sweeping motion is all about. So we'll go through some of that real quick too. So this is where I talk about um, the rescue, which is the part of the race. So it's rescue, alert, contain, and evacuate. And this could be anywhere. Uh, depending on like a facility or your own complex. Um, you wanna rescue anybody that's in the area that can't get safely out. You wanna get them to a safe location. You wanna alert everybody. So you want everybody to know and that, that dial 911 for help. You wanna make sure that everybody's told what's going on, that a fire, a true fire is happening. Containing the fire can be simply as just closing the door to that area. That's really, really important to think about. But then evacuating the area where everybody should be um, at least 100 to 150 feet from the building. You wanna be in a safe area away from cars, any of the apparatus that's coming in. And you wanna be able to, um, one, have everybody go to the same location. If you have a large complex, like you said, you had five buildings, you might have each building needs to have their own plan because building A is not gonna know what building C is gonna do. Building D to building B, building, you know, this all that nuances to building E. So it's really important to, that each building have their own plan and every floor has to have a plan. And you have to practice that floor plan and get everybody engaged into it. So understanding fire extinguishers. Teresa? Yes. Teresa, I have a question. So is the parking lot of your property at the far end uh, a good place to be the to, have, to be the meeting place. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep. I just say a far away spot. Uh, literally, code says about 100 150 feet. But um, uh, and it's just in an area where it's an area that everybody can re refuge to and, mm -hmm. and just stay out like out of everything's way. You know, the safe location. Uh, we had a building where people were actually reporting to their cars and not reporting in. So we had a lot of people like where are these people? We'll come yeah. to find out. It was cold outside. They went to their cars. They didn't report in. So we asked, report in, but if somebody does have a vehicle close by and they want to shelter in the vehicle, if it's raining or it's cold outside, that's great. Um, but we need to, you all need to know where these people are, because if you don't know where they're at, you're going to send the firemen looking for them. And um, we want to be able to, you know, do stuff. So in case the fire does occur, so everybody understands, we're not sending the crew just to one thing. We're gonna send the crew to the fire itself. And then we're gonna send the rest of the crews to deal with um, the rest of the floors. So we, we split everything up and then we keep a crew outside on the front uh, area of the building. Um, 
And that crew is designed to go in after the fire crew if they, in case that there's a problem. That's called a RIT team, a rapid intervention team. So they go in and deal with any issues that come about. So we have a lot of nuances when we see like sometimes, and this is where the media can come into play. They'll like say, you know, they'll show a picture of a fire scene and there's a whole bunch of people in the front yard and they're just standing there or one person's on the hose and he's dealing with something or she's dealing with something. Well, we all have different jobs in the fire department and those crews are designed to be backups to certain situations. Mm -hmm. And until a, um, that level is needed, they stand at their ready. And people don't realize why we do that. Um, mm -hmm. We have a unique situation here. Uh, it's, you know, you think about a football team, everybody's waiting for their time. Well, kind of that's our football team. We're waiting for that position to take place so that that next level um, can advance to take on um, either backing up the crew, uh, giving them replacement, giving them out of the fire, putting another crew in that's fresh, that's able to deal with what's going on. So there's a lot of different nuances that we have. So getting into extinguishers, there are five classes of extinguishers and we'll go through what you probably have in, well, you all have is an ABC style extinguisher, but I wanna break it down so you know what each of the ABCs mean. That's your multi-purpose, all-purpose extinguisher. And your class A is your ordinary combustible materials. That's your paper, your woods, their cardboards, some, some of the plastics, um, like the bottles and stuff like you have in your house. Um, they have a rating and their symbol is usually a triangle, a green triangle. It's very important to understand that. And that's the A. And then B is a square and it's usually in red and that's your flammables, your combustibles, your gasoline, kerosene, grease, and oil. Um, because as you know, you cannot push water onto a grease or a liquid fire. It will actually, the fire will actually stay to the top of the water and just float on down and find the next combustible item that it can get to latch onto. So that's why that's there. And then C is your electrical equipment, your compliances, your, your wiring, your circuit breakers, your outlets. Um, that is a blue circle with a C in it. And um, you see a lot of C extinguishers in computer labs and stuff like that, um, like a lot of banking industry because you can't put water on some of that electrical circuit stuff because it'll actually um, freak out a little bit more. And some of these newer vehicles, um, we can't put water on some of these newer vehicles because of the batteries. So they are um, carrying a different type of foam, which is a class C foam that will allow them to put the fires out. And then class D is usually in your chemical laboratories, uh, universities, um, companies that deal with chemistry. Uh, that's that type of symbol, uh, the star symbol. Um, and it gets you the ability to, because again, those ABCs can't put that stuff out with this. And then your K, because anybody that has a commercial kitchen is gonna be the K um, symbol. And um, it's usually, um, if you watch, read the Washington Post or any of the newspapers, a lot of times you'll see a, uh, a restaurant that's put, been put out of service for a little while it's because their system is discharged and they're not allowed to reopen and they have to make notification in the paper that's happened. And um, it's because their system has been um, engaged and that is a full cleanup. Everything gets thrown away, everything gets tossed and they literally have to go back and pull stuff up. That's what those are. And then just to rehab. Um, so the extinguisher has always been the pass system which is the pull, the aim, the squeeze, and the sweep. Um, pulling that pin out of the top, that'll allow you to engage the handle to squeeze it. You're always gonna be aiming at the base of the fire. You're not going to um, sweep around. You're not gonna go all over the place. Um, you're gonna squeeze that handle down as much as possible that you can allow the chemical to come out. And then you're gonna sweep it back and forth at the base. You don't wanna sweep it above. You don't wanna sweep it to the sides. You want to take it and you want to take the oxygen away. Once you take oxygen away from a fire, it goes out. That's what we're doing. You do that by 
um, closing the door, literally closing the door to a fire, containing the fire into that room can, once that oxygen is gone, it actually puts the fire out. We've seen that happen. Um, there's a program called Close Before You Doze. We talk about that all the time in the state of Maryland. It's a great program. I'll send it to her so that she can send it out to you guys to watch. Um, they brought some people to the Delaware Fire School in Pennsylvania. Uh, a friend of mine, Steve Kerber, is in charge. And he um, had 10 people there. And they asked, do you keep your doors open while you're sleeping with your kids? And a lot of them said, yes, because I want to hear my child. I want to hear what's going on. And um, they had a side-by-side -side burn where one bedroom was open to the door and the other door was completely closed. And at the time um, the fire was extinguished, they lowered both doors and you could see the difference where the whole one room was completely engaged and the other room was um, pristine clean. There's just a little slip mark around the door itself. Um, that's why it's important to do that. And then just going through this again. So just, this is the picture that you see of him pulling that tag. You'll always see those tags. Now your extinguishers in your buildings are mandated to be tested every year. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, COVID did put a lot of things behind. We know that, but the companies are slowly getting in place for that. We only ask that you use a reputable company um, on the fire marshal's website. You can actually find all the extinguisher companies that are out there. Um, they have to be certified for the state of Maryland. And it's important that you do the reputable because if something happens, then they have a machine that they can take the extinguisher and they can say, okay, it's been tested, it's good, it's holding its charge. And then they either have to um, take the powder out and then, or they'll replace new powder, fresh powder um, each year, depending on the age of the system. And then, um, Residential extinguishers are good for seven years. They do, are not serviced. They're a one and done type of thing. You're not going to be able to redo those. You can get those at Home Depot, Lowe's. You can actually go to Safeway. You can go to Giant. You can buy them there. You can go to Target. But um, commercial, you have to go through a commercial company. And then aiming again at the, the base of the fire and squeezing that handle as much as possible. Um, that's the tag. If you see the tag there, you can look at your tags that you have on your system. Um, look who is the person doing that, uh, the company. Um, that's who you need. Uh, you don't want somebody, um, some guy down the street, it's not gonna be the person that's gonna help you. You need a, a reputable company, a certified company. And then again, aiming it. And then these are the different things that you see. Um, just, I'll send this to you guys so you have it, so you understand. But it's, it's important to see um, you know, not every extinguisher is going to work. Some extinguishers, you actually have to have a special certification to have that extinguisher or a special license to have that extinguisher. So like a water extinguisher, there are some companies that only have water extinguishers because what they're dealing with, water is the only thing that's going to help them. Um, so they're allowed to have that. But if they were doing any other work, they would have the ABC all purpose. And can I ask a question to everybody? What do you think is in a fire extinguisher? What is that product you think it is? Anybody? Anybody? Is anybody there? Never thought about it. <laughs> Just whatever. <laughs> Some sort of chemical foam, I guess. Um, it is actually, um, how many people bake? I think baking soda. Baking soda. It really is baking soda. So the company that makes baking soda for food consumption also makes it for the extinguishers. As they're going down the track, one pile goes this way, the other pile goes this way. And it is, it's what we're really all we're trying to do is taking that one unit away from that fire triangle. Once that triangle dissolves, the fire is going out. And majority of the time it's the oxygen. So this is what just looks like using it. And then these are the different alarms that you might have in your, um, your buildings. So you have your fire alarm, which is an audible alarm with a um, visual aid for those who cannot see. 
Uh, that's the strobe light. Then you have your fire sprinkler. And if you see the red line in the fire extinguisher, that's a glass bead. That bead breaks at a certain temperature. And then there's a plunging system that opens up and allows the water to come out. And that disc at the end of the extinguisher is a water pattern. It's designed to um, like a curtain, but it comes out like a triangle and every 20 feet it goes over each other. And then this is a, um, a style of smoke alarm that you probably have in your buildings or a heat alarm or heat detector. And then this is your pool station. It's very, very important to go to all your pool stations and ensure that that card where the address is, is above that pool station. I don't have that card in here. I should do that. I should add that. But it's very important. It's supposed to be your address and emergency contact. Um, and then when you're calling, if somebody calls 911 and they pull that pool station, they could call and they say they might be a visitor. They don't physically know the address off the top of their head, but that card gives them the ability to say what the address is. And then this is the different sprinkler ratings that will go off with that, that tube um, in the different temperature ranges. A majority of the time, uh, commercial, a residential, and commercial, uh, residential, private residential, and then our commercial residential is really much in the red zone. Um, this hot black one, where it is the very hot one, that black is actually in foundries where you're dealing with high heat temperatures. So depending on um, the situation that you have, um, the building that you're dealing with or what you're working in and the temperatures that you're around, um, those extinguishers are gonna go through this. And then just um, let's go over this real quick. Uh, what is PASS? Anybody wanna tell me what PASS is? Pull, aim, squeeze. I can't remember the last one. <laughs> what do you do with a broom? Sweet. There you go. Anybody want to tell me what race is? Anybody for race? Rescue. Alarm, something to extinguish. Um, is it confined? It contain. Contain. Yep. And evacuate. Yeah. Very good. Very good. And then emergency plan for a fire. What would you all do in case of the plan? Do you all that this is where it's really important that you have to think about that. Go back to your building. Look at your surroundings really think, what do I have to do to ensure that my residents, my staff can get out in case of an emergency? You know, it's very, very important to um, get that understand and then, um, and then everybody understand it. Like, once you have that plan, get all the people involved. When you do that fire drill, have a talk afterwards. Ask them, hey, did everything go okay? Did everything happen okay? You know, that's, that's a big thing to do. It, 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 that for them, it feels that um, it's a self, um, I don't want to say this in a, in a way, they feel reassured that they know that they're going to be in a safe location. That's all they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And um, there'd be plenty of times where um, in Bowie, there's one particular place in Bowie, every time the fire alarms or the, the lightning goes off, they lose power. Those people are calling me and they are saying, we need a fire drill. I'm like, well, you had a fire drill. It, it's, it's their responsibility also. And it's, it's you guys and them. I always say it's a joint effort together. And um, it's, it's, it's important. Like I know that they're gonna call me once the power goes out. And then um, emergency plans for evacuation. This does not just focus on fire too. Uh, we've found in the last couple of years our evacuation, if we don't have the facility, we might have to evacuate because of weather. You know, like flooding, uh, if you could look at Ellicott City, how bad their flooding's been lately. Um, Greenbelt, where I live, um, we had to do, um, the firehouse is a cooling center. So people during the day, they evacuated to the firehouse. 
and they set themselves up with the Red Cross. And um, just it's it's not just fire evacuations anymore. It's it's a lot of different things, a lot of nuances, and it's just it's fire and light. It's it's a life safety thing. So it, your plan has to be twofold: a plan for any type of emergency, and then that fire emergency plan, and then that plan for evacuation can be both ways too. And then just be proactive in your approach to fire safety. Whatever you can do. Um, finding something, looking at something, um, uh, a nuance, like when you get your, your trees trimmed, are you, here's a great thing to think about. Have you looked at your address to your building? Is it visible for the fire service to see? Has anybody done that lately? That's the important part, just sitting down and looking and making sure that we do the right stuff. And then in a review, just looking at our responsibility. Um, if you have incidents, please report them. Um, make sure that all conditions are met properly. Uh, the damaged property is fixed so that no one can hurt themselves. Uh, you don't want any unsafe conditions in and around your facilities. Um, look at your extinguishers. Um, note when they have to be changed. That's a yearly thing, like I said. Your fire alarms and your pool stations. Um, when you have a fire drill, have your fire alarm company out and check them because there are sometimes like it happens, you know, just make sure they're working properly. Age does a thing. You might have to pay and have some of this stuff changed because the age changes. Um, your fire exits, are they lit properly? Are they they working right, you know? Um, don't let that light that's missing out of that light um, affect anything. And then remember all the safe places in your in your site, just in your facility to ensure that they are safe as much as possible. For that shelter in place possibilities. And does anybody have any questions? I can finish sharing this and then we can go back to a full screen. I did have a comment. We had. Um... It was, it was, we, we are right across the street from the fire department. Okay. So we have a very good relationship with them and the fire drills that we've had, um, they've come over mm -hmm. and they've done some, what you said, check out some things and found some things that we needed to correct. But after each fire drill, we do have a meeting. Oh, so good. That's good. Thing that you said, yeah. and it just kind of reassures the residents you know, they have questions and that's how we develop the fire safety team yeah. based on that first um, fire drill. Yeah, and, and that's, I have this plan where I've completed this thing called, um, it's a floor captains program that I would teach in the county and that gave them the ability to be a part of their building. You know, they, they did a lot of different things and um, that made them feel reassured that they were a part. I mean, they're a big part of that building make them part of it, you know, because, you know, they're all nosy neighbors and they want to know what's going on. Right. And we do have full captains. So that's a good thing. Oh, we did yep, develop that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything? Anybody else? I see the chat. I couldn't see the chat while I was talking. Thank you so much, um, Teresa. This is Allison. Really helpful information. And yes, we have a couple more minutes. So if folks have any questions, we'd love to take them. And Linda's information. Teresa, thank you for being willing to share some resources after the fact. And I guess um, one of the other questions is just that if folks are ever um, I, I think it was Linda who was sharing um, how sometimes the guidance has changed um, uh, for them um, locally there over time. If folks are ever confused or hearing certain things or not sure exactly what the best practice is, um, where is a good place for them to go to confirm that? Can they reach out to your office? What would they guess? And I'll type it in here real quick for everybody and then we'll send it to you so you have it and you can share it with everybody too. Wonderful.
are there any questions from folks who are, um, I think we have a couple individuals on who um, have nursing home or assisted living settings. I'm curious if there were any specific questions either from Stephanie or Dushanka on, or Phyllis, um, on fire and life safety in nursing home settings. Um, Laz is not necessarily a question. I was gonna actually reach out to Ms. Teresa separately because um, we're actually working at St. Elizabeth's, we're working on the disaster plan and those kind of things, evacuation. So mm -hmm. we're looking at, for example, it was a fire, how we get down the steps. So okay. um, choosing particular items best for the residents to get them down if needed. Like, sure. so we I was gonna that. reach out to you. Absolutely, yeah. yep, absolutely, we can do that. Okay. I, I, I should have put it in here. I like um, the biggest thing that people will do. And um, um, now that everybody has smartphones, um, I always say like, if they're going to charge their phone, put their keys next to their phone. Because, hmm. you know, um, that way, if they do have to go, they can grab their keys and their phone. And then um, some people will, um, I got it to the one place in Bowie where they have like a little go bag and it has a list of their medications in it. Right. And um, a pair of shoes, a pair of pants, and any type of other things that they might need. If they can't grab their medication, because sometimes um, you might go somewhere if you can't get to your medication. Um, some places, depending on the weather, they've actually partnered with CVS. And um, the federal government has a thing with CVS where they'll come and you give them the doctor's information. They call and they verify, and then they give you... Um, uh, several days worth of medication mm -hmm. if you can't get to it. Oh, you know, okay. Thank you for that. I'm going to reach out, out. There to help people. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I can honestly tell you, if I don't keep my keys near my bag in the morning, I'm like, um, right. <laughs> like, I know I put them right here. And my sister lives with me. And um, I'm like, I know I put them on this table. So now <laughs> my keys go immediately to the front where the door is. So right. I have it there. But now I'll reach, anybody can reach out to me and I'll, I'll help you guys wherever you need anything. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Teresa. We so appreciate your time thank today. You. Yeah. And um, everyone who registered, I have your email addresses and um, Teresa and I will connect and I will send over follow-up resources and information um, so that everyone has access to those. Carol, did you have a question? Um. Well, you know, it's funny because we actually implemented a grab and go bag. Oh, that's cool. And, and um, but I wanted them to have it at the door. I said, these are things that you definitely cannot lose in a fire. But mm -hmm. then I, I didn't think about shoes or pants, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's a good thing. So, yeah, I'm going to be reaching out to you. <laughs> Please. Uh, they say um, at least the bag should contain at least three days worth of clothing. And then you look at it every um couple like every six months because you want to change it out um, yeah he's so you want to like some people have slippers in there because you know you don't want to wear your shoes all the time but you also want a good sole shoe you don't want to be wearing flip-flops all the time if you have to walk through something a debris or whatever it could hurt your foot um so you want a good solid sole and then if you um get to wherever they have you staying um then you can change your shoes out because you want your feet to you know feel comfortable so you want to keep them comfortable as much as possible so there's little mm -hmm. things to think about mm -hmm. thank you teresa so practical we really appreciate your time i think Absolutely. you're going to be getting lots of emails and calls from folks about questions for and, you. Um, and advice so thank you for that and we'd love to have you back again sometime teresa so we'll definitely yeah, be in yeah. touch we can do other things. Wonderful. And, uh, everybody, I ask that you go 